here. And uh, speaking of in, uh, American Indian uh, spirituality is a tough thing. But uh, I'm, told, I'm, always, I'm always told I'm supposed to identify myself. So uh, I'm going to identify myself through this picture. This is a picture of uh, my mentor. Uh, his name was Wyandaga. He was an Anticoke Indian. He was also an Anticoke shaman. And he definitely had what we would call spiritual power. In the state of New Jersey, they were building a highway, Highway 55, and uh, it was supposed to go through an Indian burial ground. So what he did was he put a curse on the highway. This picture, oh no, it's not this picture. Another picture I have of him at home was actually in the first page of the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer when this happened. And uh, they had so many accidents and stuff like that on that road that they actually decided to move the, the road around where that burial site was. Uh, this man was also the president of the Indians of the Delaware Valley. Uh, there's all kinds of Indians living in Pennsylvania from reservations and all, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh especially. And, uh, and uh, to become president of that, he must have been something else. <laughs> Uh, I met him up in Sullivan County. They had a retreat area up there for Indians, and I used to go there all the time. But he's definitely a shaman. He definitely has spiritual power. He ran a uh, trading post down in Forksville in Sullivan County, and uh, I was up at the Camp Roulet Scout Camp as a counselor there, and I had the Indian Lord Muir badge, of course, and uh, I went and I visited with him, and I was the only person allowed off the reservation at night so I could go down and speak with him. So I got to know him extremely well because everybody else would go there Saturdays and Sundays, but I could get there Monday through Friday when nobody else was there. So I had him all to myself and I was very well pleased with that because he was a very interesting person. He's now, of course, gone to the other side, but he is a genuine Indian. And uh, a lot of people in our state wouldn't know an Indian if they saw one. <laughs> Because a lot of Indians today don't look like Indians because they've been mixing with the white man for centuries now. So uh, you, you can't look at them and identify them as being an Indian because they just uh, don't have the characteristics anymore. But they're still Indians, okay? But he was my mentor and he gave me my name. My real name is Machi Gukkos, which means the Great Owl. However, it was too complicated for my good friend Porcupine Pat, so I got the name Big Owl instead, and so I'm stuck with it. But when I'm with Indians, I'm actually Machigukos, okay? And I was given that name by this man here, okay? So I wanted you to see that. There's huge misconceptions about the American Indian. First of all, uh, they still write the Indians and their gods. That is very terrible. The Indians don't have gods. They have many spirits, but there is only one great spirit. And the great spirit has many names. In Lenape, there's about 30 different ways of addressing the great spirit. I only know a few of them. For example, well sit Manitou. Well sit Manitou means the good, good spirit. Katanatoit means the greater spirit. And the one I really like is Kishé Melion. Kishé Melion means, and where do you hear this one? And they, they were supposed to be primitive Indians that thought this. He who creates with his thoughts. When I first read that, I was amazed, because that's exactly what Genesis says. <laughs> he who creates with his thoughts. And I'm amazed that an Indian uh, tried to come up with that. And there were the Delawares, they used to be here in Pennsylvania. So there's all different spirits. The Indians believe there's spirits in everything. Every bird, every insect, and every rock especially. I'm sure you've heard the old phrase that only the rocks live forever. Why did the Indians believe that? Because everything else that they knew that was around them was born, lived, and died, but the rocks always remained. And the thing about rocks is we have a lot of uh, large rock formations in this area. And some of those areas were actually spiritual to the Indian. 
Uh, one that you may have heard of is called Boxcar Rocks. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. It's over uh, on uh, Goldmine Road. And the Indians did actually meet there. And there's like a really big, uh, you've got a snake from these gigantic rocks that are there. And one big rock looks like the head of something. Now people tell me all kinds of things, but because I know that this is Turtle Island, I know that's the head of a tortoise or a turtle that's up there on that rock. The Indians wouldn't have it any other way. Okay? And they used to go up there and uh, hold ceremonies and things like that by those huge rocks. And they did this all through Pennsylvania. We don't know exactly which of the rocks it is that they thought was, was special because we were moving them out of Pennsylvania as a colony at that time very rapidly. By 1740, there were no Delaware Indians where Philadelphia is now. They had all moved further west, and of course now they lived in two places in Oklahoma. One is Dewey, Oklahoma, in the northeastern part of the state with the uh, Cherokee, and the other one is that Onondaga in western Oklahoma, and they're surrounded by Kiowas. What's the big difference between the two? The ones that are by the Cherokee still have a lot of their beliefs, including the stomp dancing, which is very different from what Plains Indians do. And they still have that, they still speak uh, some Delaware out there yet, and they know some of their traditions. I went to the council house at Edadarka in western uh, Oklahoma, and they have become Plains Indians. They don't stomp dance, they don't have their language or anything else. And one Kiowa actually told me we miss their cooking. So they don't even cook Delaware anymore. Okay, so they've really lost their culture. At least the ones around Dewey have not lost a lot of their culture. So that's a good thing in my mind that they still are Delawares. So that's what happened here with, with our Indians. And uh, what I have today is some of the things that uh, Indians use one way or another because I have a very limited time, but I do want to emphasize the fact that there is only one God for our American Indians. This is not true for the Aztecs, this is not true for the Mayans, this is not true to the Incas. You know why not? Because they became civilized. When you become civilized, it seems you get a lot of different gods. But our Indians up here never got that civilized, and as a result, they have one God. I think they're ahead of the game, actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. But here are some of the things that, that they would use. The Indians believe, and I think a lot of different faiths do, that something that smells good attracts either God or spirits. So they have, every time they do something, they have different kind of herbs and all that they use that produce a nice smell. And this attracts the good spirits to where they are the good smell of what these different things are. Even when they smoke, and this is an example of an Indian pipe, it's got different Indian symbols on it and stuff, and this is made out of uh, actually a soft stone whose name is Moose, I don't know it now. You have to understand, I'm practically 80, so I'm losing my mind, okay? So I can't remember all the stuff I used to know, okay? But this is actually a soft stone, it's found in uh, Adams County, here in Pennsylvania, and it was carved into this uh, pipe bowl, okay? And they do offer smoke uh, to the spirit world and also to the Creator, because they believe that the smoke carries this message to wherever the spirits are. And at the tr present time in this room here, I think there's uh, 24 of you, so there's at least 25 spirits in this room, because every human being has a spirit. There seems to be two things, a spirit and a soul. And I'll explain that a little bit further, what the Lenapis believe, a little later. But they did do a lot of uh, smoking for uh, spiritual reasons. But they also smoked as a social thing, too. But they did, a lot of times, it was for a spiritual reason why they were smoking. And of course they have whistles, and sometimes a whistle would attract a spirit too, and they're made out of bone, and I'm going to try to blow this thing. <laughs> this is save me with uh, all kind of horns. Nothing comes out. <laughs> so we're going to try it today and see what happens.
well, anything out of sound out of it. <laughs> Some larger ones uh, I tried at and uh, it doesn't work. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of these things called medicine bags. Uh, not only do Indians have these today, there's a lot of people in the world who are, uh, I call them crystal gazers, let's see, what are they called? Um, New Age people. And uh, I was actually at Sedona, and I didn't find one vibrating rock, something's wrong with me. <laughs> but I didn't find one vibrating rock there. But Sedona is very, very beautiful. The big stone walls around there are bright red. It's a very beautiful place. And I'm sure that in the old days when the Indians lived there, because there are some uh, small ruins in that area as well, the stone ruins that uh, they used to make in the southwest. And uh, so I know Indians had been in that area. But people put this around their neck like this, and they wear it. But there's two kinds of medicine bags. You see how small this is? I don't think you could put a whole pharmacy in this little thing. So this is not for physical medicines. This is for spiritual medicine. And a lot of people who wear these don't know the difference. They just put them on, you know, it's almost like a decoration or something. But they take this very seriously, and they put different kinds of things in here. And let's see, I don't, I know I have something in here. Oh, I know what this is. I was out in the Mojave Desert in California looking for a little round basalt beads like this, and uh, they're called Apache Tears. Well, if you go to coal regions here in Pennsylvania and you walk in certain areas where there's small lumps of coal on the ground, people tramping on them constantly make these into a round form. So I gave them my name of Lenape Tears. So now we have coal. These, this, of course, is made out of coal, okay? So to, to me, this is uh, Lenape tier, and out there, they have Apache tiers. There are no Apaches in California. But you know how Americans are, we mix everything up. <laughs> okay, so that would be, that would be considered by Indians if they found this on the ground, they would consider that to have some sort of power, okay? And so, what else do I have in here? Oh. This is very important to the Indians in the Southwest. This is turquoise. Turquoise is a, a sacred stone to the Indians in the Southwest. And they use it for a lot of different things. Okay. In fact, one of the mountains that's the boundary for the Navajo Reservation is called the Turquoise Mountain. We call it something in English. I don't remember what it is. But they call it the Turquoise Mountain. So they put all that kind of stuff like that in here and they carry this around all the time. And uh, some, of, like, some of it reminds me of prayer beads. You know, a lot of different religions have prayer beads. This is almost like Indian prayer beads. Okay, so this is spiritual. If this is going to be for medicinal purposes. The Indians use well over 200 different kind of plants for food or medicine. And uh, that's a real big thing like this. And if uh, a medicine man is called upon to go to a wigwam, which is what we live in, we live in teepees, and they... Uh, they go to the house and they evaluate the situation there. Then they leave the house and then they go and uh, get a medicine bag. They put things in there that they think they would need. By the way, our doctors used to do that too. When I was a kid, the doctor would come to the house with a little bag and he had a pretty good idea what was wrong with you and the medicine was in the bag. Today you've got to go to a pharmacy, fill out some students of forms and pay a lot of money. <laughs> Okay? In those days, the doctors almost cost nothing compared to what it's like right today. Okay? So they did have a lot of medicines, and they would collect them all year round and dry them out, roots, leaves, and stuff like that, and use them as medicines, and they weren't effective. What killed the medicine men in our cultures was the fact that they were dealing with smallpox, measles, whooping cough, things like that, that were never here. And their people were dying like crazy, and the medicine men were powerless to help them. And as a result of that, many of the medicine men supposedly lost their power. They didn't lose their power. They lost the faith of the people, because people were dying, and they couldn't stop it. 
this is coming back on reservations today. But we do have medicine men out there among the Navajo, we have them among the Sioux, Blackfoot, and so forth. So medicine men still go out there and they still practice their, their medicine, okay? And of course they have their spiritual medicine with their different kinds of uh, uh, ceremonies that they have. All different, because we have over 500 tribes. We speak different languages and they have different uh, beliefs. The beliefs that you have in your people depends on where you live and how you live. That's why when you think of Asia, there's the Buddhists, there's the Taoists, and uh, Confucius and so forth. And it's where you live, it's kind of decides where you're going to practice in your religion. And of course, Europeans are way off because their, their religion comes from the Middle East. So basically, it's a foreign religion that's been imposed on Europeans. Who knows what the Europeans used to be a long, long time ago? Anybody know? Druids. 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 And that is a highly misunderstood thing. They think that we're talking about an ethnic group. We are not talking about an ethnic group. The Druids were all over Western Europe and the, the islands of Britain and so forth. So it was a culture, a religious culture that was through a lot of Western Europe. But they spoke different languages and so forth and had other things that they believed that was just local to where they lived. And that's basically how our Indians were here. You don't have Indians here who are uh, uh, getting a lot of spiritual power to cactus plants. And we don't have very many cactus plants here. And out west, they're saying nothing about hemlocks because they don't have our hemlocks. So it's always spirits of place. So if you go to Boxcar Rocks and you're quiet, you may feel a presence when you go to Boxcar Rocks. It's not an ordinary rock formation. And if you depending on how your mind is, you could get an experience out of just being there among those rocks, as the Indians did many centuries ago. Okay? Now, um, I do have other things here. This is the one I, I do programs for kids. And I have a story about how the, uh, this thing here came to be. And uh, this kind of scares the kids a bit. <laughs> because this one little boy is uh, sick. And the medicine man is trying to help the boy get well again. And so he sneaks up on a boy like this. that this did not work. This is a false face from the Iroquois up in New York State. Now, how come I can have this? I could have this because it was not blessed by an Iroquois medicine man. If this were blessed by an Iroquois medicine man, I wouldn't dare have it in my possession because they would come down here and get it from me. And hopefully I would survive the experience. <laughs> because they took me very, very serious. And in the false faith societies up there, they had all different kinds of masks. This is just one example. They would have a dream, and in that dream, they would see the face that they were supposed to carve and use in their ceremonies, okay? And that's why they were all different. Now that's the Iroquois. The Iroquois are very different than the Delaware Indians, okay? Because, to be smiling lady. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen and boy, <laughs> this is the only spirit among the Delawares that was personified by a person. And this is called Missing. 
They say he was the keeper of the game. The Lenape did an awful lot of hunting. They didn't do very much uh, farming or anything like that, but they were hunters. And if you lived along the Delaware River, they didn't even do very much hunting. If you moved from the Delaware Valley and you went up the Schuylkill River into Berks County, you would probably go on hunting expeditions over the Blue Mountain in the southern Schuylkill County, hunted for deer, got all the meat and brought it back to your village over in Berks County. This lasted for about 40 years and then they moved them on again. But for 40 years, they were in Berks County in about 11 different villages. Okay, so what does this symbolize? You see the red. Indians have two spirits. They have the blood spirit. That's the red, the blood spirit. When people pass over, the blood spirit stays here. It doesn't go to what people call the happy hunting grounds or wherever you are going. And the black represents, sounds strange for us, but the black represents the good things that are about you, and that goes on what they call the star staircase to where they go after they pass over, okay? So you have the red and you have the black. It's interesting how in so many cultures, they have two colors. One is for good things, and the other color is for things that aren't so good. And you'd be surprised how many cultures around the world have that idea. Even, I'm sure you've heard of the, uh, uh, the Rostrians, the Zoroastrians actually are in Iran. By the way, do you know that uh, the English were in England still called Iran Persia? I think that's interesting. They still call it Persia. We call it Iran. And nobody can tell me where the word Iran comes from. <laughs> so I don't know. But I know about Persia. The strange thing about Persia is it's not Persian. They got the name Persian from Alexander the Great and the Greeks. So Persia is actually a Greek term, but the, the Greeks had a lot of influence in there after they conquered the Persians, okay? So they, they didn't really call themselves Persians, but we call them Persians. But the Zoroastrians have a lot of this, a lot of their uh, religious beliefs have to do with light and uh, the power of light, okay? I always found it interesting. And even with the Muslims in, uh, in Iran, they still have Zoroastrians that are practicing over there, which I find interesting that they're left alone. Because, you know, over there it's all unsettled about all of, all of the kind of things. Anyway, this is the... Yeah. Another thing that this person does uh, when he puts this mask on, the Indians believe that when you put these on, you do not be, you're not yourself anymore. You become that spirit when you do that. Okay? You are no longer just you. So when that... Man, with this on. I have to pick on you because you're a little kid here. They go, And actually, uh, what Mi Sing was, he, Mi Sing was sort of person who could chastise children because the Lenape did not speak uh, loudly or, or correct their children at all. Because what, all they had to do was shame the kid into obedience, but they did not have to do any violence or anything like that with them. So what they do is they said, we're going we're gonna to get me sing after you. And, Woo! That really scared the kids. Okay? And so that was another purpose of me sing besides being the keeper of the game. Now we're very fortunate in our county to have an archaeologist by the name of Francis Burke, a very good friend of mine, and he found a stone face uh, out near uh, Silverton, and uh, he never told me about the, the stone face until after, you know, later on. But what happened was the state went out there, they knew where it was, and uh, Francis was coming home from work, he worked for PennDOT, and the state truck was parked along the Gornago Trail. He knew exactly what was going on. So he went out to the site, and heard this loud sound there because they had these stone drills out there. And what they were doing is they were cutting the uh, stone face out of the rock so they could take it back 
to the State Museum in Harrisburg, and that's what they did. But he caught him in the act, okay? And of course, he couldn't do anything about it, because if you had something like that, it was actually the property of the Commonwealth, not you. Mm -hmm. And so now, that's where it is. And uh, for a whole year, there it is, yeah, that's it. That's the book he wrote uh, partly about it. And so, sometimes these gadgets have a, a purpose, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Not for me, though, but for one of the people. And uh, that's a very large one, and it was on display in the main lobby of the State Museum for a year. They were having a special program, and they actually had it set up really nice. And Francis would never would have seen his own object down there, except I took him down. They said, okay, here you are. So now I have a picture of him with his hand on the uh, stone. Okay, and that's a missing cell. Okay, missing is the only thing that the Lenape people made a physical representation of. None of our tribes ever tried to put a figure on for the Great Spirit. And uh, as you know, the Jews have never done that either. That's why Moses had the burning bush, because he couldn't see God. Okay. I don't usually get this religious, but you people are religious, so I can do that. <laughs> so is that stone carving huh? Is that stone carving missing? Yes, it is. Yeah, uh, they found they found other ones in Pennsylvania and over New Jersey. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely, it definitely it took a long time for the state archaeologists to decide it was genuine, but now they finally believe it. But uh, it was actually next to a cave that used to be at the site, but there was a, a dirt road above the cave. And you know uh, how heavy coal trucks are, and they vibrated, and what happened was the cave collapsed, so the cave isn't there anymore. <laughs> but when the Indians were here, the cave yeah. was there. Yes? Two questions. Are you are the Lenape the Lenai Lenape? Um, I, 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 have, I have very troublesome thoughts when people say the Lenape. Because okay, so is, that, is it Lenape? Is well, what I say, who is that person? I never heard of Lenape Lenape. The reason I say this is because I actually went in Dewey, Oklahoma, to the house where Flushing Lee's woman lived when she was alive. And uh, there was a man there from Philadelphia, actually, who is an ethologist and linguist. And he knows the Lenape language better than anybody else who lives. And his name is Jim Rementer. And I had a big talk with him. The Lenape say Lenape. In eastern Pennsylvania, especially like in Berks County and all, they keep on saying Lenny Lenape. And uh, they do not agree with that out there. They have the blood, and as far as I'm concerned, they know who they are. And if they say they're Lenape, they're not Lenny Lenape. Okay, they're Lenape. You should see the times I have when I do programs in Berks County and say yeah. Lenape. Yeah. But he, he, he taught me how to say Lenape correctly. And so I have to say it correctly because I learned it right, okay? But uh, Lenny Lenthe uh, is not what they say in uh, the tribes themselves. So, uh, and all it means is the common people anyway. They say if you say Lenny Lenape, you're saying the common, common people, and they believe they're common enough. <laughs> so they don't need two commons, one common will do, okay? Now, I, I think I'm going to have to have time for questions. Uh, this, I'm not used to doing a program in 20 minutes, by the way. This is it's usually an hour. So, I mean, uh, the discussion of the spirituality of American Indians is endless because there are so many different traditions, okay? And I cannot possibly know everything in my head. And my computer's getting slower anyway. So uh, I have to watch myself because uh, there's no such a thing that you can know everything. And I never claim to know everything. Anybody have any questions? Um, you mentioned boxcar rocks. Where is that exactly? Um, <coughs> you know where the gold mine road is. Mm -hmm. The gold mine road is, is uh, beyond Sudberg, beyond Pine Grove, and 443. Mm -hmm. If anybody knows where Twin Grove Park is, mm -hmm. don't know where Twin Grove Park is either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's an account. No, I, I think. Actually, Trimble Park isn't in North County, it's actually in Lebanon County. But if you go beyond that on 443, you're going to come to a black road. Okay? So they would have vocals. That chant, for those of you who are old enough to know, 
Herbal and me. <laughs> was used by Chief Halftown. Oh, are you? Oops. Oh, you look a lot younger than oh, you are. Thank you very much. <laughs> but, uh, Chief Halftown used to come to Boys in Pottsville when I was a kid. I got on the East Penn bus yes. and go over. I, I saw him. That's where you saw him. Yeah. <laughs> and he would come there because of scouting. And uh, you were the terrific, terrific guy. He uh, lived in Philadelphia. He was a Seneca Indian. He was not a fake Indian. I'm not sure he was a chief, by the way, because the Iroquois themselves uh, don't quite have chiefs the way they have chiefs out in the plains. They have elders who have some authority, and that's why they have councils, okay? But uh, they don't have chiefs that have a real lot of power like some tribes do. Anyway, uh, his big thing was bowling. He taught over 6,000 kids how to bowl. And he had all these different leagues all over Philadelphia and all. And he was very, very well known and liked in Philadelphia. And I think it was WFIL Channel 6. On, sat on Saturday morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, he had these little kids performing on the stage. But they were on TV. And it was like amazing. And that's where I first learned how to sing this chant. Okay? And I use it now, every, every program I do for kids, I do that in honor of the memory of Chief Halftown because he was quite a, quite a person, okay? He was from the uh, Allegheny uh, uh, Reservation up in uh, western New York is where he was from. But he lived most of his life in Philadelphia, okay? But drums were very, very important. I don't know if any of you saw it, but there was a... Uh, a big, another big uh, rally in uh, Washington, D.C. the other day uh, against the pipeline that's in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. And it was in Lafayette Park across from uh, the White House. They had a huge number of people there uh, supporting them, including a lot of different tribes. I don't know if you ever heard of an actor named West, West Duty. He was in Last of Mohegans as Magua and a lot of other things. Uh, and he, he gave them a tell, keep the oil in the ground was his chant, you know, mm -hmm. keep the oil in the ground. And uh, he's quite a guy. And uh, I was happy to see that he was there. And uh, a lot of people there were uh, there in support of uh, the Indians up there in uh, North Dakota, including me. I don't know if you ever heard of an organization called AIM, the American Indian Movement. Uh, if I could have back in the old days, I would have joined the AIM. Because I, when I think of Indians, I get a little radical. <laughs> because they have mistreated 200, 200 uh, treaties, and none of those treaties were ever honored by the American government or the American people. But now we have NARP, the American Indian, uh, American, let's see, I have to get that right, Native, Native American Rights Fund. It's out of Boulder, Colorado, and what those people do is they put their effort into enforcing the 200 treaties with the Indians. So they got the right of uh, tribes up in uh, the North Pacific Northwest to go into the Pacific Ocean and kill one uh, whale for their ceremonies. Mm -hmm. And North is the one that got them able to do that. You're not going to kill off all the whales by killing one whale. Okay, so they're allowed one whale a year. But at least they can do it. And a lot of other things they've done for the tribes, uh, and that's why I, I supported them. I used to send money out to the reservations, but I'm, I'm sorry to say, folks, some of that money is wasted. Uh, a lot of the clothing that goes out to Pine Ridge, I found out from people who have gone out there. I've been on Pine Ridge, but never saw this. But some of that, they have so much clothing, they actually burn it. I mean, that's that's sad. But, but just, just imagine, you have something like... Uh, Three or four thousand Indians living on, on Pine Ridge, and you get this clothing and blankets and everything else from all over the country, and it pours onto that reservation. What are these poor people supposed to do with all this stuff? So there's only a certain amount they could use, and I, I think they do share some of it with other reservations too. But all the reservations out there get all this stuff all the time, and that's why I supported NARF, because with that money, they could improve the lives of the Indians, and that's better than putting the money out there and having it wasted. Okay. Any other questions anybody has? Um, you said before about there's a difference between the spirit and the soul. Could you elaborate on that a little bit more? I actually don't. I actually don't know what the, the difference between the spirit and the soul is, but the Indians believe both exist, okay. and that's, what's, that's actually the thing that's important. Okay. 
and that uh, I think the soul is the one that goes on okay. and the spirit stays. Okay. And uh, the, the Lenape, when they were traditionally here in Pennsylvania, they wouldn't go out at night because they thought that they would be subject to these, these bad uh, spirits. So then we stayed out in the daytime, but they didn't move around at night. And other tribes do the same thing. I mean, uh, I don't know if you ever saw the, the Tony Hellerman uh, stories that were made into movies for PBS. Uh, my favorite one was called, uh, uh, oh yeah, I'm not gonna get it. Uh, well, one was called Skinwalkers, I remember. And then there was another one. But the one uh, that I really liked was uh, the one about people going out there and stealing the pots and stuff like that from grave sites and all in uh, the Southwest. And that's my favorite Tony Hillman story. But, uh, and they always mention in there about uh, something called the Shindig, Shindig. And, and that's a bad spirit. And the Navajo don't like to be with dead people at all. In fact, in the old days, what would happen is if uh, somebody died in one of their hogans, is what they lived in, they'd have to put a hole in the ceiling and get the body out through the ceiling. And then what they would do is they would seal it up and never use that structure again. So you go out and see all these whole guys out there and probably most of them always in it because they were afraid that Shindy might be in, in, that, uh, in that dwelling. Uh, as I said before, uh, we're talking about 500 different cultures. They don't all believe the same thing. A lot of tribes believe that the owl is uh, a bad omen. The Lenape did not think the owl was a bad omen. But uh, a lot of times do, and it says it means a predecessor for, for death, somebody's going to die. And so uh, they don't like owls too much. See, I don't believe in all those beliefs. Uh, I was once challenged uh, on Lenape beliefs, and I said, uh, well, if I believe the Lenape way, what about all the other ways? So I'm neutral. As far as uh, spiritual beliefs go, I'm neutral except for some basic beliefs, like there are two spirits, that there is a great spirit, and everything's got its own spirit. Every, everything that's on the earth has its own spirit. And uh, the Indians are not the only people in the world who believe that, by the way, that everything has a spirit. Okay, any other questions anybody has? Yes? Just a comment, Dave. One of the books that we're going to read this summer is called The Wayfinders. And it's by Wade Davis, and it's about people losing their languages. When and I, having worked with Shoshone Bannock, when I was working with the at, at Fort Hall, there were maybe only three or four Bannock speakers on the reservations. And so, what you're saying about the 500 tribes, when they lose their languages, they lose their culture. To a certain extent, that is true. However, um, I hear this a lot um, about the language that's true. However, at the same time, there are the beliefs that the tribe has that they could still do. Like, look at all the Indians that live in these big cities. It's totally different from where they're from. Uh, because in the, West, in the West, they don't live in this, well, they do, Los Angeles and all of it. There's still a lot of, I'm glad that, you know, it's, it's a sad thing to think of uh, that the Indians, you know, are on reservations. It sounds like they're on pri in prisons. But here's the alternative. If they didn't get that land, even if it isn't really good land, they would have no land base. Like our tribe in Pennsylvania, the Delawares, have no land base in Pennsylvania at all. And I know some of these groups that are Indian, sort of, and all they do is bicker among themselves. I'm more, I'm more uh, Delaware than you are. You know, you're not Delaware, I'm Delaware. And they actually went down to, uh, they had a, actually had a committee on this in uh, the, the government in, uh, in Harrisburg. And they went out down there and they bickered among themselves. And, you know, the, the white folks there, what's wrong with these people? You know? And they're, they're never going to get anywhere because they will not cooperate. I mean, it's really terrible what's happened in Pennsylvania. But our Indians, all the land, by the way, in Pennsylvania was purchased. Yes. It's the only state in the Union where all the land in that state was actually purchased from the Indians. Mm -hmm. And that's why we had a uh, sort of like a peaceful transition when our Indians were starting to move out of the Delaware Valley to Berks County, then along the Susquehanna, the West Branch of the Susquehanna, 
out in uh, western Pennsylvania, the North, northeastern Ohio. By the way, there is a Delaware County in northeastern Ohio. <coughs> and they were constantly going further west. Now, why were these Indians constantly moving, other than Andrew Jackson and the Indian Removal Act of uh, 1830? They were moving because they did not want to change their way of life. The Indians are condemned today because they still don't want to change their life, and white people do not understand this at all. They do not want to become us. If they become us, they disappear as a people. And people do not understand that. I understand it fully, but a lot of people don't understand it at all. And uh, when you want them to do this, that, and the other thing, I know uh, the federal government, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, put a lot of different things on Pine Ridge. They, they tried to build up a, a tourist uh, industry on Pine Ridge. They put a motel there, a restaurant, and all this. You know what happened? They couldn't get Indians on that reservation to come and operate these things on a reg regular basis because Indians don't operate that way. And we have to operate that way because it's business, you know? And they don't, they don't, they don't get that, and they still don't. And as far as I'm concerned, they don't have to. Uh, if they want to be as, as they are, they are. And the thing is, modernizing them to be exactly like us, that's not what they want. It's what we want, but that's not what they want. And you say, well, why is there such a big alcohol problem on the reservations? Because we won't let them alone. They, we, will, we will not allow them to be who they are. And they, we, we just insist that they have to be us. Now, I'm going to tell you something that most people don't know. The Franciscans went on to all the different reservations and all the founded schools and stuff like that. And they were like really strict Catholic way of doing things. Finally, I don't remember which pope it was, but one of the more recent popes changed that whole thing. I used to support St. Stephen's out in uh, the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming. And now they, they, they have to drum during the Mass. They, they have the, the, the sacred, uh, you know, uh, different vapors and all. And they've incorporated a lot of this stuff into the Catholic Mass. What people don't realize about the Catholic Church is this. The Catholic Church is called the Universal Church for a reason. What it was supposed to do all over the world is adapt to the various cultures they were dealing with. And for a long time, the Catholic Church did not do this. It's only recently that the Catholic Church finally figured it out, and now they are ad ad adapting to their different beliefs in the different parts of the world, but the core values in Catholicism are is still there, but it's done in a different way. It was a wise move that they would do that. Yes? There's a very interesting church uh, in Chinle, Arizona. I mean, you know, you talk about the incorporation of the, the traditions into the Catholic Church. And it's a beautiful church, and it's built like a hogan, the eight-sided hogan, and the Jesuits run it. And when you come into the lobby, uh, there's two glass doors, and on the glass doors, there are depicted the Yeguche, which are their holy people. And I had an opportunity to talk to the Jesuit priest, and I said, well, this is a Catholic church, you know, why are the Yeguche on the doors? And then he explained the same thing you just did about incorporating their values into the Catholic Church. And it, it was most interesting because they had a baptismal font right in the middle aisle, but it was bare ground because mm -hmm. when the child is baptized, because that's they, connection to Mother Earth, Mother Earth yes. and Father Sky. So they were baptized on that ground in the baptismal font. And every all the work in the church was done. Uh, like the altar was carved from local wood mm -hmm. by uh, the Native Americans there. And so, you know, that's a really interesting uh, concept. Well, if any of you folks ever get to uh, uh, Cody, Wyoming, uh, actually, uh, the Wind River Reservation isn't that far from Cody, Wyoming. And go out, go out and go out and see St. Stephen's. It's a very beautiful church and all the motifs and stuff like that inside the church and outside the church are all Indian. And uh, the, the Jesuits used to run that, but uh, there's not enough Jesuits anymore. So they get a, a, a priest from the diocese, I think of Minneapolis or something like that, and they get different priests to go out there, but they're not Jesuits anymore. And uh, it was the Jesuits that were making the changes there too. 
The interesting thing about the Jesuits is they're the most educated of all the priests, and they always have been. And but they were actually organized to counter the Lutheran Revolution, you know. And back in those days, if you didn't believe Catholic, they stretched and quartered you and everything else. <laughs> of course, those days were long gone, thank God. But uh, it was that way. And the Jesuits have really changed over time. And they're always in, uh, in trouble with the Holy See because of the way they are. And they're, just, they're that way because they're so educated. And uh, they live in the 21st century. And uh, I think Pope Francis sort of does. But uh, all, of, all of the popes don't live in the 21st century. Uh, I know that the one before him tried to go back to uh, some other century, and it didn't work out too well. So now he's retired. <laughs> so, so that's the way that works. Any other questions anybody has? Okay, you're a very good group, and uh, thank, thank you for bringing me here. Thank you. I have to say thank you.